Tonight we're going to Naples. This is the fourth and final lecture uh, that I've been doing on traveling in Italy. And it really started uh, last year when Scott saw a movie called Angels and Demons, which was largely, and you saw it, I can see you grinning, uh, in Rome. And uh, so he said, well, why don't you show your Rome pictures? Because I've been doing a number of these lectures on different subjects. So we did the Rome lecture, and then I did a second one um, cruising to Italy on a ship uh, from New York to Lisbon to Palma to Palermo and Genoa. And then the third lecture, which we did in the spring, I picked up from Genoa, went to Milan, Torino, no, not Torino, but Monte Carlo, and finally Pisa and Florence. So tonight we're going to go to Napoli, to Naples. And, uh, you know, most tourists don't go to Naples. The big three cities, Florence, Rome, and Venice. But Naples is fascinating. Many people just don't get to Naples, but outside of Naples are some of the most touristed areas in Italy. Pompeii, Capri, and the famous Amalfi Drive. We're going to cover all of those tonight. So we'll get started. Without further ado, Um, hi. Hello. Come right in. Well, Naples is a port city, and it's, uh, I'm starting this lecture with focusing on the port. My first view of Naples was, uh, coming in on a ship early morning in a very heavy mist. I remember telling the steward in my bedroom to please wake me up early because I want to see Capri as we go by. Well, when he woke me up, we were almost in port. He said there was no point of waking you. The fog was so thick. But we got into Naples. It was a hazy morning. Uh, I was aboard on this trip, the Italian liner, the Leonardo da Vinci. This is the uh, Maritime Pier in Naples. Um, the Stazione Maritima, and the Italian line would move their ships around and back them into a pier. The ship behind it was a British, a canard liner, which was there. And as you see, the sun was slowly trying to break through. Today, of course, most people fly, but in the old days when you went to Italy by ship, uh, many people um, arrived in Naples. It was the port. Well, this is the uh, stevedores waiting to help passengers with luggage and so forth uh, uh, on the pier. I was only in Naples on one day in this trip uh, and I, I was going to other parts of Italy but when you get off the pier uh, you're in very nice area, major street um, unlike New York which is uh, the piers were pretty desolate until a few years ago and very close by is this castle known as the Angevin Castle from the Angevin Kings that once ruled this area. The moat or courtyard, which was now sort of a grocery um, market. I and another passenger uh, who, like me, was going on to Genoa, spent the day touring and we walked around Naples. And uh, very close by were three major points of interest, the Royal Palace, the Great Gallery, and the Royal Opera House. And uh, being interested in opera, I was very anxious to see the San Carlo Opera House. And to my delight, it was open for touring that day. So I was able to get into the San Carlo. This is one of Italy's grandest opera houses. Fortunately, escaped the war without too much damage. It's colossal, it's magnificent, it's incredible. And there's the house as it appears from the stage. This is San Carlo. On this same trip, I got to tour La Scala in Milan, but somehow I thought this one was even more beautiful than, than um, La Scala. 
When I went back later on for a longer visit, uh, opera was not in season, but um, there were concerts. And uh, to my amusement, the first night that I went to a concert here, I picked up the program and they were doing a piece by Westchester's own Samuel Barber. So talk about being local. Samuel Barber, Nakwe, Westchester, Pennsylvania, in the program. Well, the gallery is a fantastic place. There's a similar one in Milan. The one in Milan is named for King Victor Emmanuel. This one was for King Umberto, who was the second king of the United Italy, Umberto Primo. It's about 185 feet, I think, to the top of the glass dome. And again, although Naples was heavily damaged uh, in the war, it pretty much survived without too much damage here. Full of shops, offices, but still you see poverty. Poor little kid pulling a wagon. Downtown Naples is very crowded, very built up. It is Italy's third or fourth largest seat. This caught my eye, this funeral car. I told Kevin Mountain he should come tonight because I was going to show him. I said, you've got nothing like this, Kevin. But uh, I know there's another one later on. Well, this church is the Church of St. Francis de Paul, San Francesco di Paolo, across the street from the Royal Palace, and it, is, uh, it was a royal basilica, built as a Roman uh, pantheon. And I took this picture inside, looking up to the dome. And it, uh, from the front steps, you look across to the old royal palace. Really a Roman pantheon all the way. <clears throat> and as I say, it was a royal basilica, only used for royal family weddings, funerals, and the like. But when the great Italian tenor Enrico Caruso died, the king ordered that his funeral be held here. I love these lions that were at the end of it. And I got one of the natives to pose for me. <laughs> I was a little younger, a little thinner. And that was looking into the Royal Palace, which unfortunately was not open that day, so I didn't get to tour it. But there it is, it's massive, it's enormous. Now why would Naples have a Royal Palace? Well, the reason is that Italy, until the mid-19th century, was divided into a great many states. Unlike France, England, Spain, which early on gathered together under a central monarchy, Italy had a number of states. One of them was the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, which was Naples, the area around it, the Campania, uh, Lucania, Basilicata, Calabria, and the island of Sicily. And it was an independent kingdom until it was finally united. I and the fellow passenger who walked around a bit, we had many lovely views, the palace, the harbor. And nearby, I had to go here, this is Santa Lucia, famous in songs, of course and um, hotels. And this used to be known as the Borgo Marinara, the uh, fisherman's little, little port, but of course it became touristy and was full of restaurants. You see one there. And uh, this little uh, monument was at the corner. And a hotel, this is the Excelsior Hotel, one of the best known. And uh, I stayed here when I came back to Naples a couple years later. Well, we all decided to have, a, I and my friend decided to have a good long leisurely lunch at this Z Teresa restaurant, which was right by the water, as you can see. And little boys moving around. And of course, they had a strolling group of musicians. All the tourist songs, you know, Finicula, Funiculi, Solomir, Waymarie, Come Back to Sorrento. But this elderly tenor came by my table. They would ask if you wanted anything in particular. So I sort of threw him for a loop. I said, yeah, can you sing an old Neapolitan song called Mamma Mia Che Vosa Pei? Now that has special meaning to me because my grandfather had stacks of old Caruso and other recordings, and I always loved that number. Caruso sang those things with great style. So the tenor looked at me, rolled his eyes, as only a Neapolitan can, and said, oh, Caruso. And I thought, well, I'm not going to hear. 
But a little later, he came back and they went through several courses for me. And of course, the kids, the squinies, they're, they're um, all set up and they would hang by the side of the tables and beg. And keep your eye on your camera or anything else that you've left on the table, sir, it might disappear. But these were the squinies, the kids. There's a great deal of poverty in Naples, and of course this one my friend took of me, I couldn't resist posing. <laughs> oh, I adored Naples. As I say, I only had one day, because on this trip I was spending most of it further away. Again, the, the palace complex, which of course was not all a residence, it was offices of the, of the Neapolitan government. And back to the Angevin castle, which was very near the piers, and late in the day went back to board the ship. This was uh, one of the other Italian liners, the Michelangelo, which happened to be in port at the same time, and is quite large. Um, Italy was always a seafaring nation, and unfortunately, most of their ships were decimated during the war, the Rex and the Savoy and the Augusta. So after the war, Italy went in for a big uh, rebuilding and finally built these two massive liners, the Michelangelo and the sister ship, the uh, Raffaello, and one of which was in port, and of course there's Vesuvius in between the, those piers. <coughs> well, we sailed late in the day mm -hmm. on to Genoa, and the harbor is quite large, and I'm showing these first because you have to get the feel of Naples. It's a bay, it's, it's the harbor is, is the lifeblood of the city. And of course, during the Second World War, the retreating Germans blew a great deal of it up. The captain and the officers and the bridge of the ship. There's a long breakwater that we pass through to get out. And again, there's Vesuvius. Dormant now, at least they hope. The United States Navy has always had a large contingent of ships there. And there was always some in port. This was taken again as we were passing out of, the, out of the harbor, and there's Vesuvius again. It hovers over the city like a cloud, I mean. But it, I think the last time it erupted was about 1944, shortly after the American occupation of Naples. And of course, every Italian going home has to have his picture taken with Vesuvius in the background. So there's me. So we sail, and of course I had many thoughts, thinking of my own grandfather and his sisters and brothers as they, what it must have meant to get on a ship and come to America when they were quite so young. Well, on that trip I, I only spent a day in Naples because I was touring in Genoa and Milan and so forth, but a couple years later I went back and this time stayed at the Excelsior Hotel and had a room, one of those top floors with my own little balcony. The Excelsior is part of a chain in Italy called Chiga. Compania Italiana Grandi Alberghi, the Italian Grand Hotel Company. And uh, I was most amused if any of saw that television drama a few years ago, The Sopranos. Well, there was one, one scene in which Tony Soprano and his boys go back to visit the big mafia chieftain in Naples. And in the TV show, they're getting off the taxi, getting in the hotel, and it was right here. I think this all looks very familiar. This was the uh, concierge at the Excelsior, and of course they were wonderful, they made a lot of the travel arrangements for me. And there he is with the hotel porter. <clears throat> and uh, this gentleman was a uh, professional uh, tour driver who uh, worked with the hotel, and I wanted to make some trips and I wasn't about to drive myself. And he was marvelous, his name was Chiro Foggia, and he was just marvelous, and I spent a lot of time with him. So when we did the Amalfi Drive. And I had a room on the top floor and every morning they would bring me breakfast there as I sat and looked over the little harbor. It was very nice, very nice. Still a push cart here now and again, a little donkey cart. Well, Naples downtown, as I say, is very crowded, it's very built up. And still it's, uh, uh, it's got a reputation. A lot of people are afraid to go to Naples. They think it's poverty, and there is. By the second trip, they'd cleared the cars, for the most part, out of the, 
the plaza in front of the church, so it was much better looking. I never tired of walking around from the hotel on the waterfront and looking at the harbor, ships coming in and out. And so this time I determined to get a good look at the Royal Palace. And I did. This is the facade that faces the church with the entranceway. The statues are of various kings and rulers of Naples, the two Sicilies. Um, this was sort of an alteration made to the palace in the 19th century with this series of kings and it's been criticized that it spoiled the original design but it was interesting to see these uh, these kings and of course the Neapolitans being uh, somewhat irreverent had their own comic designations of these various kings But the palace itself is, was just fantastic, this massive structure. And of course, um, after the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies was united with the rest of Italy, this became a royal palace when the king of, would go to Naples. But of course, the monarchy is gone since the Second World War. And these palaces are largely museums now. One moment while we change the reel. Emba. Something not sticking right. Something stuck. Sorry. Sam, you're the expert on this. Right. Something caught. There we are. Thank you. <clears throat> One of the uh, gateways into the palace. I love these old lanterns. And when you come in uh, to the palace, you come into a great courtyard. And one of the grandest staircases I've ever seen. Uh, watch the wire, okay? Seems out of focus. That's better. Thank you, sir. It was a bit dark and I didn't have the kind of light to get a clearer picture, but you can some idea of the ornateness of this uh, palace. That's the plaster work on the ceiling in the middle, the seal of the House of Savoy. And of course it was under the House of Savoy that Italy was finally united as a kingdom. Looking through some of the windows out to the court or to the outside. And it's a succession of very grand rooms, marble floors, ornate furniture. It took quite a while to go through the place. Had its own theater, some very ornate chandeliers, great mirrors. They didn't have any slides available to the interiors and I didn't have the kind of light to get what I wanted. This was the actual throne room of the uh, Neapolitan um, kingdom. Gene, are they no candles? Pardon? <laughs> yes. Are they real candles? Yeah. Uh, no, I think they're, you know, uh, modern light fixtures that were made to look like old candles. Okay. Yeah. And on the upper level, you could go out on a terrace and uh, there was this garden and uh, really quite beautiful vistas from there. Again, you see the House of Savoy, uh, the cross in the uh, ironwork there, the grating. And it was sort of a Pompeiian red uh, plaster stucco that's on the side of the building. And from the terrace, a beautiful, beautiful view of the harbor and of uh, Vesuvius again. I always loved the story Caruso and the Metropolitan Opera were in San Francisco at the night of the great earthquake and fire and Caruso says this is an hell of a place give me Vesuvius <laughs> <laughs> but you can look back towards the harbor and there's the Da Vinci and uh, which was there 
Well, uh, one of the things to do in, in um, Naples is to go to the upper level of the city, a section known as Vomero, and they had a funicular railroad. Now this is not the one that inspired the song Funicular Funiculi. I think that was the one that once ran to Vesuvius. But this was great fun riding this thing. So I walked around and of course I saw the, the upper area, the Vomero, which was very pleasant. It was away from the congestion of downtown. And there was a movie theater with playing Il Padrino, which of course is the, the godfather. Seemed very appropriate to see this in Naples. So I was told to try a restaurant up in the Vomero called the Ristorante Renzo e Lucia. So I went. The food wasn't bad, but the view was spectacular from this restaurant. Absolutely spectacular. So I had a very pleasant lunch there. And uh, when I was there, there was a wedding party. Uh, what do they call it in Italian? Sposolito. They were having a great time and they saw me, recognized me, I guess, as a visiting American. The first thing you know, a waiter came over with a complimentary glass of sweet wine from these people and of course I saluted them with it. But wonderful views of the city from up there. It's quite large as you can see. There's an old proverb, Vidi Napoli poi mori, see Naples and die various interpretations, but I think it was basically if you grew up in the hill country in poverty and you finally got to see the great Naples city, well, you know, you've seen what there is to see, so see Naples and die. Uh, there is what had been a monastery in front of the old uh, prison of San Elmo on the top of the hill, a city museum now, and from the terrace there you got great views, again great views of the city and the harbor. I love Naples. I'm just fascinated with the place. There's more life in Naples. I mean, it's such, such uh, vitality. Now, if you look in the picture, in the left center, you see the Royal Palace and then the distance across the dome of the Church of St. Francis de Paul. Again, the great city. Some modern buildings, uh, which seem out of place downtown, but this was a hotel and one night I went up there, they had a dining room in the very top, which uh, had spectacular views. Now this is the Naples Post Office, built during the Mussolini era in the 30s. The Germans, when they were retreating, uh, left a time bombs in this building. And shortly after the American army took over Naples, uh, they went off and a lot of people were killed. The building wasn't all that badly damaged and of course it was restored, but this was the Great Naples Post Office, which um, you know killed a lot of civilian people with this time bomb that went off after the war. Well, you have to look at old Naples, and uh, I did. I walked and walked through these streets I wanted to really get the feel of the city, and here it is. <laughs> South Street a little more, huh? Vegetable stands, people. But it was all very interesting. An old church tower, a lot of churches in Italy. This was a monument, I think, to the Immaculate Conception. Um, it was quite, quite high, it was over 100 feet high, something, huge memorial. And this church has this unique front. The stone is cut like, uh, almost like diamond heads. And I had a, an amusing experience here. There was a group of boys about that age playing ball. And there was this one kid who, uh, oh, he looked like he stepped out of a Renaissance painting, a real faccia di Angelo. And uh, after a while, this man who was probably in his mid-30s came up. The boy came running up to him. I thought it was his father. Uh -uh. The kid then proceeds to pull out of every pocket package of cigarettes which he had stolen. <laughs> you know, and the man was taking him. And I was reminded of Dickens' novel, I think the character is Fagin, who teaches these boys to steal. And then, with great triumph, the boy pulled out of his shirt an entire carton of cigarettes. I said, Gene, I'm thinking, don't take a picture, because you didn't know what you're getting into here. <laughs> Some more of these back streets. What's called Spacanopoly, S-P-A-C-C-A, -C -C -A, these streets, Spacanopoly. A 
And there it is. Well, here's another one of those funeral cars mounted on a Mercedes um, uh, body. I mean, that's, that's a stylish way to go. I mean, look at that. The Italians are great on this, la bella figura. Make it look good. <laughs> but I got a big kick out of seeing this, this funeral car. First class. Uh, another old church. Now this is the uh, doorway to the main cathedral uh, of Naples with very ornate ironwork. And the, the front facade of it's sort of gothic. Now one of the uh, interesting things here, they have a vial of blood which is supposed to be the solidified blood of San Gennaro. And once or twice a year, it liquefies. And it's the annual miracle, and the Neapolitans believe in it. And uh, if it liquefies the San Gennaro blood, it's considered a very good omen. I didn't see it, no. <laughs> One of the oldest gateways to the city. Uh, and a small square. One day I was having lunch and you see a statue there, sort of left of, or right of center. Interested me, being an opera lover, this was a monument to Vincenzo Bellini, one of Italy's famous opera composers. And uh, underneath it were the statues which represented the heroines of some of his operas, Sonambula, Norma, and so forth. Bellini. Well, admiring Caruso, one of the things I wanted to see was Caruso's birthplace. So I had a driver for this who took me to a very poor section of the city. And Caruso was born right here. And it looks from the photographs I've seen as it looked when he was born. He was one of something like 18 children, most of whom died at early ages. To my surprise, despite Caruso's fame, this was not a museum, it was still just a house, you know, with all the washing on the rail and so forth. But it was here that the great tenor was born. And there at least was a plaque on the wall commemorating, you could see it behind the wash. <laughs> uh, so also in my pilgrimage, I visited Caruso's tomb, uh, the old cemetery called Del Pianto. And my driver took me there, and we saw this. Uh, he died in 1921. He spent much of his life in America. After great success in Europe, he came to the Metropolitan in New York, I think in 1904. And for many seasons, he was there in New York, lived in New York at, at the Metropolitan, uh, singing with the Metropolitan. He, but he became ill. He went back to Italy to hope to recover, and stayed a while in Sorrento, and then he was stricken and um, died actually in Naples and was buried here, 1921. He was only 48. Still regarded as one of the greatest singers in the history of opera. Well, after we left the cemetery, we were coming down and here comes another funeral carriage, horse-drawn. Now this is really something. The other one was first class, I'd say this is deluxe. So that was sort of a late afternoon visit of watching this funeral thing go by. On another day, I went to another portion of the hill above the city to what is called Capo di Monte. Some glorious vistas up there. And a Capo di Monte is still another royal palace, the Palace of Capo di Monte. The kings wanted a place higher up, away from downtown. So here it is. Very handsome building. Lovely grounds. Capo di Monte. Capo di Monte is also famous for China. There's a particular type of China made in the Capo di Monte uh, section. I love this. Uh, as you see, I had a very clear, beautiful day. And uh, it was really quite, quite lovely. Another change.
Here we are. This was a pleasant day spent touring this palace. Uh, the proportions of it I thought were really quite graceful. Uh, the upper floor, the top floor, was made into an art museum, one of the neatest and uh, best arranged art museum I saw anywhere in Italy, all due respects to Florence, but it was handsomely done. And of course there were a great many very elegant period rooms to go through at Copo di Monte. And I love taking pictures through archways and getting the vistas framed. And again, I love the ornate old lanterns. There's a succession of arches. These buildings usually had center courtyards. And so the arches would lead to a, to a second or a third one. <clears throat> I like this one with the the red walls and the dark shadows. The painting collection is extensive. Um, I was amazed at how much was there. This was a staircase, stair hall in the building, one of two pretty much like. Uh, a much religious scenes, of course. And there was uh, this of, um, I think, King Philip II, Titian, Tiziano and uh, a lady, also Titian, and a Magdalene. This is, I bought these slides. And uh, this was a Goya, the Spanish artist. That's a little out of focus. And a lady, also a Goya. A very popular painting of a boy, and I've forgotten the exact title of it, but it's, uh, everyone loves this picture. Sell a lot of postal cards of it in the museum shop. Uh, there was one room in the palace that was filled with some of the most ornate samples of Venetian glassware and chandeliers that I've seen anywhere. But again, the vista from the top of the hill of Capo di Monte. A great cloud. Well, I decided to do touring outside of the city itself and uh, to go to Capri. Americans pronounce it Capri, but in Italy, A is usually A, ah, and you usually make a word longer rather than louder to emphasize it. And you got to go to Capri. So one morning I was up early, the hotel made all the arrangements, and I went down to this appropriate uh, pier location to get a boat to go to Capri. And as I say, Naples is a huge harbor and there's boats everywhere. <laughs> Incidentally, the Bay of Naples is like a half moon and the city is located for the most part on the north side and around to the east side would be Vesuvius, Torre Nunziata, and then on the bottom, so the south side would be Sorrento and Capri is off of Sorrento. So, this was a very pleasant ride. This was uh, the ship that I was on. It was coming into the pier. And it was a hydrofoil. And it was much faster than the regular steamers. I think we made it over there in about an hour and a half or so. So there we are, moving along. And uh, Capri has a sort of romantic association. Everybody wants to go to Capri. It's one of the most touristed places in Italy. And here we are speeding across the Bay of Naples on the way to Capri. Well you get there and you realize that uh, it's quite a dramatic piece of real estate. Great rock pile really. This headland and on the one side there is a small harbor which they call the Marina Grande and there you see a long uh, breakwater, which is what we pulled up to. There's the boat there and I got off. And um, the hotel had made all arrangements for me and I got into a cab. But we could only go so far uh, in the cab because the hotel street was not wide enough and um, I ended up walking with, with a uh, porter taking my luggage. But this is the view from the Maria Grande, Marina Grande. And what you see when you land at the main harbor in Capri. Well, up ahead, this is the hotel where I stayed. It was called the Quisisana. 
which I'm told means aqui se sana, here you're well. And it was a delightful, beautiful place, marvelous food, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. And I had a room on the very top floor with one of those open galleries. Aquisisana. And from the back I could see the famous rocks, and we'll show more pictures of those that are often photographed at Capri. This is the view from my balcony. Well, I uh, decided to explore the island. There's a, there's a square, uh, sort of little piazza, which is sort of the, you know, the gathering place. Everybody wants to go there and have a drink and look it over. And during the summer, when boatloads of tourists come on day trips, the place is jammed. I was there in early October, and it really wasn't all that crowded. An old church there in a church tower, and I meandered around after a great lunch. As you can see, Italians love to sit and eat outdoors and have drinks. And it's the place to be, this square. And of course it's on the upper level with a view around the city, around the harbor I should say. This is Capri. Well, to get down to the, or up or down to the lower level, again there was a funicular railway, which I got a big kick out of riding up and down. Um, I had a major disappointment here. I had bad weather clothes in. Um, everybody wants to go see the famous Blue Grotto, which is a cave with, filled with water. And my very first night in Capri, it started to rain, and by the time I came down for dinner, it was pouring. And the uh, hotel people said, oh, it's the Scirocco wind that blows over from Algeria. It might last for days. Happily, it only lasted one night. It was pretty wild, but I never did get to the, to the Blue Grotto because every time I went down to the pier to see if we could go, they would say, no, not today. Even though it cleared up, the water is too high, it's too agitated. E mare alto, e mare agitato. So anyway, I didn't get to that, but there were enough of other interesting things in Capri to keep me busy. And that's a, a, fly, a slide of a map that I bought. On the upper side is the main harbor. There's a small harbor on the south they call the Marina Piccola. And on the left of the picture, a very high area they call Ana Capri. So I went on, and this is a slide I purchased. Uh, this is near the Blue Grotto. You get on a boat at the main harbor. They take you over here. You get off the boat, you get into what amounts to a rowboat, and you have to lie flat and they take you through uh, with uh, ropes pulling it through. But I couldn't get there because when I was there the sea was too high. <laughs> you, uh, there have been many thoughts, well why don't we open it up, why don't we build a wider entrance, and everybody, the geologists say no, you'll ruin the, the unique light effect. Well one day I took a bus tour, we went up to Anna Capri, and the driver very nonchalantly pointing out everything while we were on hairpin roads that I would have been nervous to drive on. That's looking down into the, the marina. And there it is. <coughs> a slide I bought of a famous old staircase, and no, I didn't climb up that. But that was the old way of getting up to Anna Capri. A lot of villas up there, statues some old ruins, and a lighthouse purchased on a cliff. There's a great deal of shipping in the area. And that's a vista looking across to the mainland. This is the other side of the island, the, uh, where the Marina Piccola is. I got some cloudy weather, so I bought some slides. Frankly, uh, I wasn't all that taken with Capri. I mean, there's almost nothing in the way of beaches, but yet it's a place to be. There's a lot of very costly, expensive villas here. And uh, it's, a, it's a great rock pile, really. And some of those villas perched on the end of the cliffs, I mean, if you had a, if you had a, could we close that door? I think it's a little too much light. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, if you had a, an earthquake, and this is a volcanic area, you'd be gone. 
One of the uh, families, wealthy families too, in the 19th century established themselves here in this area with the Krupps, K-R-U-P-P, -P, the German steelmakers. And um, apparently they partied pretty heavy and eventually the Italian authorities asked them to leave. <laughs> well, this is the famous rocks or the Faraglione, which are called the Fangs, which I could see from my hotel room. And they're much photographed and they appear in many travel travel, um, oops, I'm going very fast. But I contented myself with walking around the island. There's a lot of beautiful flower displays, houses, and it is truly a fascinating place. Lush gardens, Many beautiful vistas. <clears throat> and sometimes, you know, with changing weather and the shimmering clouds and the sun in and out. This is one of my favorite pictures from the visit of Capri. A lot of rocks and way down to the sea. Don't lose your balance in some of these things. And there you are, there's another picture of the rocks, the Faraglione, the fangs. And pleasure boats come very close to them sometimes. Again, narrow walkways, heavily built up. This is another view of the, of the old square at, uh, and again, there's always, seems like there's always fruit stands <laughs> everywhere in Italy. <laughs> Lots of oranges. Well, my last day in Capri, I decided to take a walk up to the high point where the Emperor Tiberius had his villa. No way to get there but walk. It took me quite a while to, uh, to get up there, but I wanted to see it. Uh, notice the lady with the basket on her head, carrying it, taking a rest. And it was an interesting walk. It took me quite a way. You can see on the top of the hill there to get up there. Now Tiberius uh, was emperor during the early Christian era, I think from AD 14 on. He had a fairly long reign for a Roman emperor, something like 22, 23 years. Not a favorite, the Romans hated him. They thought he was a bloodthirsty tyrant. And one of the things that turned the people off was that he wasn't interested in promoting the big games and the sports things as some of the other emperors were. Call those Colosseum shows bloody, but the people loved them, you know? I mean, they were big entertainment. But there you can see some of the ruins of the villa. It was called Villa Jovis, J-O-V-I-S, and it perched on the top of the cliff. I was getting closer and closer. Walk through these lanes <clears throat> to get up there. The story goes that uh, if you were invited to visit the emperor, some people took the invitation with great concern because those whom he didn't like, he usually didn't come back down. Uh, the story is that uh, they were pushed over the cliff and it's about a thousand feet down. But if you did survive, there were always guards on the bottom of the hill to finish you off with clubs or swords. Tiberius had quite a bad reputation. It was cloudy when I got up there, but that is the mainland on the other side. And there's a vista straight down. I am frightened with heights, but I, I am determined to see this. Uh, Tiberius sort of exiled himself here the last several years of his reign. He didn't spend much time in Rome. He stayed here. And uh, if the stories of him uh, are to be believed, he had quite a licentious time here. Surrounding himself with young people of both sexes with all sorts of great fun. In fact, some of the accounts would make Hugh Hefner's Playboy Mansion's frolics sound rather tame. There was a famous historian named Suetonius who wrote a rather well-known book called The Lives of the Roman Emperors. And he describes much of this. Whether it's all true or not, I don't know. 
Suetonius uh, had a reputation too for being something of a gossip, so it might not be all accurate. But anyway, that's where he stayed and that's uh, where he spent much of his time. So these are the ruins of Villa Jovis, Tiberius' palace, which uh, the very last portion, there was a walk, a circular walk that led to a chapel that had been built. And I took one look and the walk was straight down, thousand feet, and I didn't go all the way. So this took quite a while to do. That's again across, the, I'm sorry it wasn't more brilliantly clear, but that's the mainland. But I was glad I went up there and saw this. And then I made my way back down to the hotel. Absolutely starved. And I had one of the grandest plates of just spaghetti I ever had anywhere, all due respect to my mother. But I had a great meal, and then I had, was scheduled that afternoon to get the boat to go to Sorrento. So I'm back down at the pier. No sooner did I get on the boat, we had this horrendous rainstorm kick up. But the rain stopped and the boat pulled out, and I had a memorable ride through very choppy waters from Capri over to Sorrento. And there's that headland, and the villa was on the top of that hill. And as we passed it and I looked up, I thought, oh my God, and I was on that very top of that cliff just a few hours before. <laughs> but I'm glad I did, it was a great experience. So we slowly made our way across the, uh, the way. And as you can see, it was pretty rough. We had, it, there was an enclosed cabin, but it got so rough, I was starting to feel a little ill, so I went out to the open area in the back, because I wanted to take pictures. So I took a number of pictures as we made our way across this, this bay. There's Capri receding in the distance, and the sun tried to come out. I love this picture with the sun just under the island. A lot of rocks. You hope the boat didn't get blown up against them. The whole coast is very rocky, very rocky. And when uh, in the Second World War, when the American Army was invading this area, there weren't too many places where they could successfully land. You can see how the weather was changing rapidly there, clearing. And more rocks. And it got quite beautiful. And the sea calmed. And uh, pulled into Sorrento, and this is the hotel where I stayed. That collection of four buildings, it was the Excelsior Hotel Victoria. So we pulled into that, and you can see the headland of, of Sorrento. And uh, as the boat pulled into the little pier there, I got a good look at this hotel. And um, if you look sharply, just in front of the building on the left, on the right, there's a little yellow building. That was the top of an elevator. So I got off the boat, walked up to the, you can see the word Excelsior, and that was the elevator beyond that. And I got off on the main uh, terrace of the hotel right there. It was a very neat elevator operation. And it cleared up beautifully later that day and I was able to take some pictures from the terrace at Sorrento. And this was the hotel. And I was in the middle building and again had the fortunate uh, of a room overlooking the bay. And it was here that Caruso was trying to recover uh, before he died. And he became ill and they took him to Naples for a trip on to Rome for surgery, but he only got to Naples and died where he was born. The cloud effect here, I like this picture so much. This is one of my favorites. The pavement was still wet and the shadowing of the, the uh, porch rails and the mountain in the distance. In fact, I have an enlargement of this at home, framed. Looking down on a little pier where we had gotten off when the boat pulled in. Now Sorrento is a sizable little town and it's a very busy place for tourists because it's on the south side of the bay and it's close to three of the major attractions, the Amalfi Drive, Capri, and Pompeii. And many tourists will stay here rather than in Naples, it was closer to them. 
The hotel had lovely gardens, lots of flowers, and uh, quite a lovely pool, and good food. I enjoyed the stay there, Albergo Victoria, Excelsior Grand Hotel. And uh, this was a local church where I heard Mass the Sunday that I was in um, Sorrento. section of the hotel um, and there was this drop uh, it's, it's really these things are all built on a cliff I mean if you want a beach go to Avalon or Wildwood there's much better beaches than anywhere I've seen along here I picked up this slide one of the things I was hoping to see was the performance of the Italian dances the Tarantella and there was a nearby nightclub in Sorrento where I did go one evening and saw a performance of this sort of thing this uh, was a shot from my bedroom window overlooking the sea and again I'd have breakfast there in the morning and had this beautiful vista across the harbor. It's really, uh, it, the blue is real. I mean, it, these aren't colored slides. It was the Mediterranean blue. And this was one evening, I think it was the last evening I was there, I took this shot from my hotel room. Well, the hotel, I wanted to do the Amalfi Drive, and I wasn't about to do it myself, so the hotel had arranged for uh, Signor Foggia, my driver, Chiro, and uh, he met me at the hotel in Sorrento, and I did the drive with him. Now, this is quite a famous drive uh, along the sea through these great rocks, and we... Um, Give me one minute. In fact, would you turn the light on for just a moment, uh, please, Carol? Give you a break for a minute. Six, this is five, six. I know which seven and eight the boxes are marked. Okay. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Please. This was just leaving Sorrento on the road. I, who am nervous about height, I don't think I would have the nerve to drive through much of this. The road isn't that wide. I understand at one time it was just a carriage road, but it was improved over the years. You can see the road on the left of the picture there. But the views are absolutely spectacular as you go along, built up. Many uh, tours will pick you up at Naples, take you to Sorrento. They hustle people on, you know, a day or two and then take this drive down to Amalfi, which is a small town, but there you can see how precipitous this is, this coast. This is a little car. You want a small car on this road, too, <laughs> believe me. And Chiro is just marvelous. Well, there you see the road. We stop here and there. But amazing to me, there are uh, grapevines, uh, uh, terraces where they raise grapes on a, in every spot that was arable. Couldn't imagine working up there. And you look down on little towns. Uh, I think this was, um, oh, I forget which one. These are great resorts. They're very popular. People come. Churchill used to go there and, and uh, paint. One place there was a Madonna. And here's Chiro, my wonderful driver. He was quite practiced. And uh, he took this picture of me. This is Positano. It was Positano, which is uh, quite one of the better known little villages along the road. And you can see these houses built on terraces. Straight down. Little tiny beach there. It's quite dramatic. 
And I was happy that I had perfect weather for this beautiful day that we did this drive down to Amalvi. <clears throat> Some well-to-do person had a, an estate on this island, or a little peninsula. I understand Jackie Kennedy, one of his many guests, I forgot who it was, but it was pointed out. And uh, there you see, uh, it, it's, I, I don't remember the mileage, but it was quite a long drive to get to Amalfi. We finally got there, a small beach, busy community. And uh, on the top, uh, that arch structure was a, um, I think a monastery at one time, a Cistercian monastery. But there is a small beach here. <coughs> and of course, cars, <laughs> uh, small cars, and the usual animated Italian populace moving about. Luigi Barzini, who was a famous Italian author, wrote a lot of books, said, you know, the best thing to see in Italy is the people. And I have to agree, they're the best show in Italy. Just watch them. The Italian people, delightful. There's a famous old church there, and this was the bell tower. Notice the uh, ornate top to it with all the colored stones. And you see photographs of this in many travel brochures of Italy, the church uh, at Amalfi. I took this to the arch. Then this picture is one of my favorite of the whole trip. These kids were there. Oh, Americano, camera. And so there they are. Italians are born posers, you know, absolutely born posers. I thought from time to time to do a calendar using some of these on Italy, and I, if I did, I'd use this picture. It's great. Well, we drove on from Amalfi, and there's the, there's the road. As you can see, it just hangs the cliff. It was quite an engineering feat to build this thing. A lot of stone blasting. This town, this here, the road goes right around this small town with the church. I think this is called Trani, this, this area. Most of the tours stop at Amalfi, but we went beyond because I wanted to see more of the coast. So we went further on down the line from Amalfi and came to a town called Ravello, ancient uh, church tower. And uh, at Ravello, there was a, um, a couple of villas to be seen. Uh, the Villa Rufalo, which has really impressive gardens overlooking the sea. And as you can see, it, it was just beautifully planted. Ravello. And looking down the coast further, there's a couple more communities, um, Maiori and Minori, and those communities there. This is from the terrace of this villa, which had a lower level garden as well as the upper level. Really spectacular. A lonely pine tree. This again you see in many tourist pictures of Italy. That garden was just spectacular, and, and it's below the main level, and you, we went down there, of course, to see this. The Villa Ruffalo. I've seen this shot in a number of tourist brochures, these little towers in the pine tree. That's Minori and Maiori, the two towns further down from the villa. Now in the middle of the place was this old tower, which fascinated me. Again, my interest in opera. The story is that Richard Wagner, the great German opera composer, spent time and lived here for a while. And this tower was the inspiration for the garden scene in uh, Parsifal, the evil magician Klingzer's tower. And so that made it all the more interesting to me. I happen to like Parsifal, although I'm not a heavy Wagner. This is uh, Klingsor's Tower, as it's called. Interesting, almost Saracenic uh, artwork on this. 
I took this looking up through one of the archways. Villa Ruffalo. The antiquity is everywhere here. And again, I like to take pictures through archways. Well, we got hungry on these drives and I was told not to miss this restaurant, which was called Caruso Ristorante. It was famous for food and we had a marvelous grand leisurely lunch here in between the Villa Ruffalo and then in the afternoon went to see the Villa Cimbrone. Also nearby, great gardens, perched on the hills and with spectacular views. Cimbrone. The villa itself wasn't too grand, but the gardens were splendid and the vista is just uh, magnificent. Hard to leave a place like this. Ornamental statuary, long vistas, uh, <clears throat> approaching that archway. <clears throat> And when you came right to the edge, there was this really literally on the edge, a uh, grand vista with these classical statues overlooking the sea. Again, this picture, this view turns up in Italian tourist brochures. And I love the sea and the cloud effects and the silhouetted statues. I'm very fond of these. I haven't looked at these pictures in quite a while and I dug them out for the show and it brings back a lot of memories of the, the day we spent between these two villas. The sea is everywhere. I was always grateful to Pierre de Pont for Longwood because being familiar with Longwood gave me sort of an initiation into Italian gardening. And of course Longwood was heavily inspired by Italian Renaissance gardening. That's another favorite picture, the leaves against the, the sky. This is still the village in Verone. Well, after leaving it, we continued south. Uh, this was in the village there at Rivallo. And drove towards Salerno. Uh, heavily mountain. I mean, this is rugged countryside down here. And we drove some time, and I was impressed with this trees embedded into the wall along the highway. I never saw anything like that. Rather interesting. Well, this is Salerno, which is a fairly large city. I didn't spend any time, just drove through it. Salerno was pretty badly battered during the Second World War because, you know, we uh, American army landed in Anzio, which is not far away from this, and Salerno was the nearest town. But it's been rebuilt since the war. There's a lot of new buildings there in Salerno. Well, the final stop of this drive was to go to Paestum, P-A-E-S-T-U-M. Uh, this is the site of Grecian temples and I had one of the most remarkable experiences anywhere in Italy here. Uh, the Greeks, you know, settled the area first and the name Naples comes from the Greek word Neapolis, new city. And there's a series of temples which have been preserved. The main one to Neptune, another one to Ceres. And in this field are these scattered remains of these temples. Absolutely fascinating. And I spent quite a time hiking here and uh, had a delightful, just impressed with this, that these survived. 
Well, Chiro, my good guide, I was, I was about ready to leave. He said, no, Senor Dior, you're going to stay a little longer. I said, why? He said, wait, the sun's going down. So as the sun started to recede, these buildings turned to gold. Absolutely gorgeous. It was one of the most exciting things I've seen in Italy. Because I have a passion for classical architecture. And there it is. This was the Temple of Ceres. There was great concern with these when the Allied invasions took place at nearby Anzio that they might be damaged, but fortunately they skirted around them and they were not damaged to any extent during the invasion landings. But they really did turn to gold when the sun hit them. This was taken a little earlier before the sun hit. This is the main, tomb, uh, main temple, the Temple of Neptune, and there it is. This is clear Doric architecture. The Greeks, of course, were great builders. And you know what I thought of as I watched these? The Philadelphia Museum of Art, yes. which is done in Greek style. Really clear Greek architecture. And if you've ever gone by there, when the sun hits it at late afternoon, the stone turns bright the same way. I was fascinated with this. It was one of the most exciting things. And I, was, I knew about the temples, but I wasn't quite prepared for this beauty. And as I say, my, my good driver, Shiro, said, no, you gotta, gotta stay and see this. Clear Doric architecture. Pestum. There are Grecian temples surviving in Sicily, which I have not gotten to see, but uh, yeah, the other Greeks were here first. Very dramatic, these columns standing. I like this picture completely. Uh, well, it was a very momentous afternoon spent hiking around these fields here at Paestum. Well, the most famous ruins, of course, are Pompeii which are further up the peninsula, up the land. And Pompeii is, of course, the city that was buried when Vesuvius blew up in AD 79 and destroyed a very popular and impressive town. When the ruins were discovered, I think it was somewhere in the 18th century that they first started the major excavation, or the scavi, as the Italians call it, the excavation. And here again, I spent much more time than I expected, many hours hiking around. It's totally fascinating to see, to see this, uh, these ruins. Now, this was buried under volcanic ash, not lava. Hollywood have you believe of hot lava pouring down on it. Uh -uh. It was actually volcanic ash, which was one reason why so much was, uh, it was, it was easier to, to excavate this when they did it. Note the old paving stones, the stone walls. And again, I had beautiful weather the day that I spent in Pompeii. Now there's another, I didn't bring them because I thought it might be too much, but there's another uh, buried city that's well worth a visit called Ercolano. The city of Hercules, and it's called Ercolano. It's closer to town and it actually was buried in lava and it's taken much longer to excavate it. Also, there's much modern building over it, and it, the excavation at Hercula is no way near as extensive as it is here at Pompeii. Again, it's amazing how much has survived, these houses. Gardens, vistas through various buildings, now, of course, many of the finer things that were found in the excavation of Pompeii are not here. Uh, not wishing to expose them to weather, uh, the National Museum in Naples has many of the things that were actually found here, statuary and things like that. But there's enough here to fascinate you. I mean, just look at that. Notice the mosaic in that floor, the patterns.
And there are paintings uh, on some of the walls that have been carefully preserved. They were painted on the walls. There's quite a lot of this. This is a sampling of it, um, which you see. I purchased these slides. And as modern people like to point out, some of the pictures are quite erotic. But again, I say there's nothing new in the world. The Romans enjoyed themselves. Uh, these are some of the many paintings that have survived on the walls in Pompeii. Uh, human bodies were found uh, in the ruins when they were excavated. You know, they had just become solidified. And uh, there were only a few of them here, but there were more in the, uh, in the museum in Naples. Can you just imagine the horror? A normal day and suddenly Vesuvius blows and you're gone. The amphitheater. It was a busy town. It had its amphitheater, its playground. And uh, I think they still have events here from time to time and using this old theater. Much of it overgrown, of course. And then there was another uh, theater uh, for smaller things. Pompeii was quite a busy city. Again, my passion for taking pictures through archways. Always Vesuvius looms in the background. They say it is dormant, and I suppose the uh, experts are correct, but some of the Neapolitans always look up to it and see if there's smoke coming out of it. <laughs> uh, the last major eruption, I think, was 1944 shortly after the American army had taken over uh, the city. You could spend days in Pompeii. I mean, it is really a fascinating place. Long vistas, long streets. Of course, I imagine the roofs of most of these buildings were wooden and they didn't survive the, you know, the ashes. My final picture of Pompeii as evening was coming on. Just one minute. Well, I decided to take a break from Naples and its environment and go into the country. My father's father, my grandfather, my grandfather's brothers and sisters grew up in a section called Apulia. Now if you know the map of Italy, the, the boot is Calabria and the heel is Apulia. And the upper province of it, the province of Foggia, was where my grandparents, grandfather and his family came from. So I wanted to see it. So my good friend Foggia, we arranged a trip and I got up before dawn one morning and we drove across the countryside from Naples packed uh, some food with us because we didn't know where we would eat and had this drive through the countryside um, little villages and I love this one the wine cart I think it's his wife poking out of the back with a bandana around her head <laughs> I mean this could have been pictured a hundred years ago it was quite cloudy that morning uh, we went through a little town called Lucera Stop, took a look around. And of course the Italians are always out shaking hands, talking. <laughs> yeah, it's a... And we, kept, and we ran into an area where it was October when there was snow there. This is a very mountainous, uh, hilly country. One of the reasons southern Italy has always been poor is because, um, you know, it's not great agricultural and a lot of it's pretty rough terrain. Another hill town that we passed. 
and I love this picture. To me, this is classic Italia. In fact, I have a large print of this I had made hanging at home. The lady with the basket on her head and the long road. I mean, she was walking. <laughs> Italia. Well, then we came to the town. The town that where my grandfather came from is called Roseto. Roseto Valfortore. Now, a lot of Italians came from this area. And, you know, the tradition was, you know, one person comes over, then another one comes, and they all stay in the same place. Well, up in Northampton County, there's, there's a community known as Bangor Roseto. Not far from Bethlehem. And uh, a lot of Italians from Roseto settled up there. In fact, my grandfather lived there for a while. And my great-grandparents uh, are buried there. So here's the little town of Roseto. Now, I had written in advance to get information. And uh, I uh, was delighted the gentleman in the blue coat, second from the right, was the mayor. And he wrote to me. He, he was a dentist, and he lived part-time in Roseto and part-time in Naples. So he, we told him when we were coming. So we were greeted, Chiro, my driver, uh, the, the policeman from the um, Carabinieri there, and the mayor, and I forgot who the other gentleman was. But they were very gracious, and they welcomed me and uh, had a delightful day there, well, uh, looking at this ancient town, the churches, and of course the wash hanging out. And I said, take away the cars and the television areas, and it could have been the 14th or 15th century. Uh, the little, and of course the kids always watching. And the little square looked like a setting for Cavalleria Rusticana. And I just, uh, I was fascinated with it. And as I say, uh, um, the local officials were very gracious. And uh, I think one of my father's cousins had gone back to see Rosetto. So when I got home and showed these to the family, most of whom have never been to Italy, let alone, they were fascinated to see an ancient community, really. Someone did a book on Rosetto, a medical book, studying why so few Italians had heart attacks, despite all the pasta and wine they ate. <laughs> they decided, well, there must be something good there. This was a medieval sculpture I found in one of the walls there. local church and uh, met some other people who and the, they s indicated that I was from America and they gave me a couple of bottles of wine and I thought oh this is going to be wonderful to take home to my father wine from Rosetto so it was carefully packed I took it home on the ship and when we opened it it had spoiled unfortunately <laughs> But uh, it, was, it was great, and it was a, an experience to go into the back country. And the boy with the mule. And as we left, we went up on a hillside, and I had this final vista, and I stood there for a long time. It was a, an emotional experience for me. And you think of your ancestors who for generations lived in these villages, and the courage it must have taken for somebody like my grandfather who was a teenage boy, you know, to leave and to go to Naples and get on a ship and come to America. It took courage for that immigrant generation. And I stood there for the longest time and I was very moved by it. And again, I have a picture of this shot hanging at home. Well, we were on our way back and we got stuck for a railroad crossing. And there's a train going by. We got back to Naples, as you see, almost in dusk. Well, <clears throat> uh, on another vista, where I went to the north of Naples. Um, and this is a section known as Bagnoli. Now the smoke coming up comes from, guess what? A steel mill. Idle cedar. Uh, Idle cedar was uh, the Italian uh, steel corporation. Special interest to me because when I was here at Lucan's, for a number of years, Lucan's had a, uh, an arrangement with Idle Cedar. We had technical people going over there, helping with plants, and technical people coming here. We had quite an association with the Italian steel for some time. And this is one of their plants. It was a big one, an old one, uh, called Bagnoli, on the north side of Naples. 
This was a church in a village nearby called Pozzuoli. Now Pozzuoli is, is kind of interesting, charming old village. And for those of you who like Italian movies, this was the birthplace of one of my favorite Italian performers, Sophia Loren. She came from Pozzuoli. Very humble background. Well, the north area is interesting too, not as famous as the area south, again, right along the sea. And uh, there's an island called Ischia, which is off the north side. It's much bigger than Capri, not as famous, but it's also a resort area. Went to visit, the, while we were there, the temples of Serapis, another uh, ruin from Greek Roman times. Not much of it left, but interesting to see. Serapis, and this is in Pozzuoli. Well, another interesting thing in the north of Naples is to go see the sulfur fields. This is on top of a really volcanic area, and it's called La Solfatara. And you see these great fumes of sulfur coming up through the ground. Yes, it smells, but it's fantastic to see, a natural wonder. And we toured this. <clears throat> And interesting, uh, from some of the rock that becomes hard through the sulfur operation, they made jewelry. And I brought home for my mother a couple of necklaces, one black and one white, made from the sulfur from this area. This was a unique phenomenon. The whole area is a volcanic area, and of course Italy is subject to earthquakes, and you know, you never know when it's going to happen. The sulfatata. Well, the grand finale of this uh, lecture was to go continuing north to Caserta. The kings of Naples, uh, not satisfied with two great palaces, one of the kings built a third one in a place called Caserta, and this is enormous. Well, Louis had Versailles, so every other king had to have a country estate. I had to get far away to get half of the building in the picture behind me. It's enormous. And um, it was designed by a, a well-known architect whose name was Von Vitelli. And when you go into the thing, you were just overwhelmed with the impressiveness of it. Um, it's divided into four separate courtyards. In the middle of this, there's a great archway. And you get the vistas of the courtyards as you go through it. Much of it's government offices now. And during the Second World War, after we got as far as Naples, I think a lot of the British and American Army had offices here. But you go through it, there's these vast corridors, and it, they're just overwhelming, the size of it. And even more so, when you come through the central corridor, and of course the building itself has fantastic ornate rooms, including a throne room, which is one of the most ornate rooms. I'm sorry, I don't have any pictures of it. And on the other side, we had a bit of rain that morning while we were there, then it passed. You go into a garden. The first part is, uh, beyond the main, is just flat lawns. And then you look, and actually it goes to the top of that hill almost. There's a cascade. To feed the fountains, water was brought from something like 25 miles away to feed the fountains of this thing. Uh, and this was done in the mid-18th century, the 1740s. And there you see the whole thing, the palace. The farther you walk, the palace looks bigger. <laughs> and you could take a car on this drive. Some people just doing a walk. I mean, it's so far. And, uh, and there's a, a lot of trees. But then you come into an area where there's a more elaborate gardens. And you can just see through the hill the cascade coming down. I'll show you that at the end of it. And there is a, gris, a, a vista there. I don't know where the water goes after it gets to the palace, but the king's grand idea, which he never achieved, was to build a canal that he could go from the palace by boat all the way down to the harbor. That never got done, but what was done is still spectacular. And there's these long waterways, and you can see the palace in the distance. It's breathtaking. I think it's the most elaborate 
palace garden I've seen outside of Versailles. Huge uh, fountain groups, statues, mythological figures in the statues. <clears throat> As I say, Longwood sort of prepared me for this. And there you are looking back towards the palace. You can get some idea of the scope of this thing. I think it's something like a mile and a half from the back of the palace to the Cascade. Never mind that most people were poor, but this was a grand thing. At the upper level, there's another fountain uh, with a group of statuary classical mythology, Diana, Acteon, with the hounds. And the water falling down. I couldn't believe the place, it, it was just great. And then, there's the cascade, with the water coming down from the top of the hill, which feeds all those fountains and all those pools. Well, we have one last reel. Finish the tour with a bit of grandeur. Well, one of my days is driving around. Every travel, there's a tradition that travel lectures should end with a sunset, so here's my sunset contribution. This was taken again on the North Shore near Pozzuoli. And I like this with the silhouette of the boats. Well, this was my last morning on this trip. And I was having breakfast on my terrace, watching the sun, and looking over the boatyard there and eagerly, eagerly scanning the horizon for the arrival of my ship. Uh, the Raffaello, which I was using to come back home. And you can see it coming through the mists. And the, my sailing was not until midday, so I had plenty of time to sit on my terrace and have breakfast and watch the ship coming in. You can see it there through the mist. The Raffaello. It and the Michelangelo were sister ships. So finally there it is, and the one with the two stacks looking down from my balcony towards the harbor. Well, back down to the pier. And when, as I say, when you got off the pier at Naples, you were in a very nice area. Unlike New York, when you got off the pier in New York until they built a couple of new ones. There's worse piers, I think, I, uh, anywhere. And there she is, the Raffaello. Um, these piers, other ships there as well. And these uh, movable uh, gangplanks that move along whatever level they need. And there was the Da Vinci, which I had crossed two years before to Italy on, and I loved the Da Vinci. And she happened to be in port. She's getting a bit of rust there. These ships are all gone now, of course. But uh, it was interesting to hike around the piers. I had plenty of time before I actually had to get on board. But there it is, it's a big ship. Those stacks were very interesting. They look like lattice work, but they were considered hot modern when the Italian line built these things. And again, the piers. And another ship on the other side of the pier. Numerous small boats. I mean, there are boats all over the Mediterranean, and this was a car ferry. I think it was going to North Africa. Well, time to leave, and there you see some more American naval vessels, and the tugs pulling us away from the pier. So, away we go. I always found um, it was a certain moment, you know, with all the excitement of sailing. You, you don't get this feeling in flying, you're just encased in a tin can, but with ships, you know, the band's playing and the flags are flying. And then comes the moment when it pulls away from the pier, inches, feet, and then suddenly you realize you're in a whole nother world. So here we are, moving away from the pier. 
San Elmo on the top of the hill, three liners there waiting, one of them was waiting to sail after us. And we passed the great uh, breakwater and out to the, to the sea. The co it was somewhat cloudy that afternoon as we moved out, but it cleared up and the sea was calm. And I really had a very, this was almost November when I made this crossing, but really had beautiful weather. Well, the next morning was brilliantly clear and we were in the Mediterranean. And uh, we passed the sister ship, uh, the Michelangelo. It's always great fun to see other ships at sea. But in this case, these were the two sisters and we were told we were seer and she came on at a good speed. In fact, I was surprised at how close they brought them together. My first trip to Europe back in 63, I was on board Cunard's great old Queen Elizabeth and in mid-Atlantic we passed the Queen Mary, uh, which was a breathtaking sight, but uh, they didn't bring them quite this close. But uh, hey, you know, Unbel the Italians move it fast. <laughs> but I was surprised really, but it was a great sight to, to see this going by in clear weather, beautiful. The Michelangelo. When the Italian line gave up the ghost and sold these things, I think they were sold to Iran, who used them for military ships, and I think they're gone. They were destroyed in some fighting. But there it was. That was the excitement of the day, uh, watching this thing go by, smoke pouring out. I wasn't crazy about the Raffaello. Um, it vibrated a bit. And uh, I think there was some miscalculation between the weight of the ship and the thrust of the engines. I remember I had a stateroom on the front of the ship on the upper level. And I remember the uh, pillowcase in my stateroom had fancy lace trims. And I could see it moving. It would vibrate. In fact, my very first night on board, I was coming up from dinner and I stopped at the purser's office. I said, you know, I've noticed vibration coming up the staircase. I said, have you got a propeller out of whack? He said, no, senor, this does it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but it was slight vibrate. Of course, all ships vibrate, but yeah. But we had rather beautiful weather on this crossing. Just a few sea pictures. And that was the sunset. Uh, we stopped at... Um, Algeciras, which is the southern coast of Spain, right at Gibraltar, at night. And it was an impressive sight to, to be there. This is my, a beautiful sea picture, I think, the sky. One of the reasons I travel by ships is because I love the sea and the lights and the shadows and the various moods are always very interesting. One day we had a rainbow. Very clear crossing. It was, it was good. And although it was early November, like the 1st or 2nd of November, it wasn't all that cold. Spent a lot of time on deck. And I always love to look out the back and watch the long wake from the ship as you move. Well, we're approaching New York. I took a lot of pictures, which I didn't bring tonight, but these I thought you might especially like to see. We're approaching New York, the Verrazano Bridge and past a tanker. And there we are approaching the bridge. And uh, Scott and I got well acquainted with the Verrazano on our several trips to New York to go to El, the uh, airport to look at the trees when we were negotiating with the Port Authority. So there it is. It's really a beautiful bridge. And of course it's great fun. Uh, as you approach, you wonder if the ship is going to if the masts are going to clear it. You notice on the right and middle distance of the mast there's a Canadian flag. You see the maple leaf? So happened the Canadian ambassador was on board the ship and that's why they were flying the Canadian flag. And he was on deck standing next to me and the two of us were watching this. We were, are we going to make it? Is it, it going to hit the thing? <laughs> but here it is, just as we went under. It's really a spectacular bridge. And the last time that we went to JFK, when Scott and I were there to watch the trees being loaded, we came back late night, and I always remember the beauty of the lights on it. It was really quite impressive. Well, that's passing.
and we're moving up the harbor. Now, in the distance, you can see the World Trade Center. How dominating the skyline at such a great distance. Uh, the Verrazano Bridge crosses what is called the Narrows with Staten Island on the west side and Long Island on the east. And we're heading right towards the lower um, tip of Manhattan and you can see those buildings. And of course it's always a thrill to see the Statue of Liberty. I mean you can never be blasé about it. Especially when you've been away in Europe. And what a symbol that must have been to people, the immigrants getting to America. So we're Prowl is headed directly towards the World Trade Center. And there they are, tip of Manhattan. Now the trees that we brought home are from the North Tower, the northeast corner of the North Tower. So there they are. I watched this never dreaming that, you know, something like what happened that did eventually happen. Pardon me? Are they still constructing the Twin Towers there? I'm sorry. Were they still building it? Uh, no, uh, they were built in the late 60s. They were finished about 72. They were um, just brand new. These pictures were taken in 1972. The crane on top. Yeah, there was a bit of finishing on the South Tower. The North Tower, as I recall, was finished first. And uh, they weren't quite finished with the South Tower. These were taken in the fall of 1972. Mm -hmm. The uh, smaller building in between the towers and that dark building is the Woolworth building, and can you believe that was once the tallest building in New York? And uh, happily it survived without serious damage. It's a major landmark in New York, and when those of you are going on the bus trip, you'll see it. It's very close to, to ground zero. Well, we moved up the harbor, and of course New York is always exciting. That's the Empire State Building, which now is back again to being the tallest building. But as soon as the Freedom Tower gets finished, uh, it won't be. And there's the officers and the um, pilot. A pilot always comes on board out in the outer harbor and does the actual direction with the officers of the ship into the pier. We're looking due north. You can see the George Washington Bridge in the far distance. A little windborne, blown, but there I am on deck. The tugboat pulling alongside. When you get to the pier, the piers in New York stuck out and they would bring the ship in prow first and they sort of slowly moved it around. Naturally the officers are anxious, peering over the side of the bridge. And we're looking right at the corner of the pier as they slowly turn it around. Spaces aren't really all that wide. Sometimes it's even more difficult if there's a ship on the opposite pier, but there wasn't this time. And we're moved in very, very close. You can see this. The piers in New York were never very attractive compared to the ones I saw in Italy. These people, are, the captain's got his hand up. I guess he's relieved it's in. We didn't hit the pier. Well, I got to New York and my final picture, I stayed a few days and this was taken from my hotel. I'm looking over Central Park and Central Park West. And I think the first night in New York, I went to the Metropolitan Opera. So uh, that was the end of that trip and that's the last picture. I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, have the light, thanks. to let that cool. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to uh, try to answer them for you. How many days was your crossing from Italy back? On the Raffaello, it was a uh, full week. It was seven days. Seven days? Yeah. Imagine our grandfather, what they put up. Oh yeah, well, they were much slower. Yeah. The Raffaello, uh, I don't know what her average speed was, maybe 23, 24 knots. Mm -hmm. um, my first trips to Europe were made on the old Cunard Queens. And of course, they did 28, 29 knots. They were faster. And of course, it's shorter to go to England. Yeah. Whereas Italy, you go, you're going straight across, but then you have to go through mm, probably 1,500 miles to get to, um, to the Italian, through the Mediterranean. Mare Nostri, Arsi. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you all for coming. Glad to have thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.
I should have brought a, there was a wonderful, delightful little lady, this is kind of funny, uh, one day at the hotel in Naples, uh, I'm coming down uh, the elevator and uh, there was a lady already on, tidy little lady, she looked like she just stepped out of a church supper, you know, the little lady from Dubuque or something. She looked at me and then somebody else came on and I spoke English, she said, oh, she said, you speak English, I'm so glad, I'm tired of this. <laughs> This lady came from San Francisco, right. came from very, as I found out, very prominent family. And um, she had been in South Africa for some time. And she had taken a ship from South Africa to Italy, and now she was going home. So, uh, I mean, she was just such a neat little lady. Well, the day we sailed, the uh, hotel was arranging, um, um, if you wanted the uh, cabs or a little bus jetney to take us down to the piers and they got some of the paperwork mixed up and there was a real problem. Well it turned out when I got on board she and I were at the same dinner table so I spent the, across the Atlantic with her. She said did you come on, a, on the hotel bus? I said yeah. She said so did I. She says and it was so funny because she was such a tidy little person. She says what a GD nuisance the whole thing was. <laughs> Turned out, uh, she came from a prominent family. Her grandfather was a friend of, of uh, Leland Stanford, kept his horses on Stanford's estate, and she was very much into horses. So it so happened there was a horse show going on at the, at the uh, New York um, Arena there, Madison Square Garden. And so uh, the very first morning I was awakened early at the hotel, I told her where I was going to be. Get up, you're coming down. <laughs> so I went to the horse show with it that afternoon. <laughs> But it's always great fun to some of the people you meet on board ships. Um, the Raffaello was, was grand, it was very big. But the previous crossing I made on the Da Vinci, I adored the Da Vinci, it was just exquisite. And talk about an e you know. Mm. But uh, it was great fun. Well, thank you all once again.